Today we bring you Eddie Ojeda from Twisted Sister. Eddie was one of the main featured guests of the Rock and Pod Expo. And we were asked to interview him on the main stage on the Saturday of the event. So it was kind of, we were kind of billed as uh, one of the highlights of the event, I guess. Yeah. I know it was a highlight for me. And so just so people are aware, we typically did our interviews at our booth, which was off to the side, the Talk Louder podcast booth. For this particular interview, we were brought to the main stage and uh, we did the interview with Eddie in front of an audience. Um, there was people gathered around. Uh, we had a great conversation with Eddie. He couldn't have been more just cool and chill and down to earth. And uh, obviously a career that uh, has many, many avenues that we explored. Uh, so we had a great time with him. Yeah, he was, uh, uh, he was, he was also, I feel extremely lucky that we got Eddie. Yeah, I'm not, I do too. No, I'm not throwing shade on any of the other guests that were that were panel discussion, you know, on the main stage. But I feel like we kind of won the lottery. Yeah. Uh, well, it, he, the, I mean, could it be? I'm going to go out on a limb here and hope I don't wrinkle anybody's feathers. He's the he was the biggest selling artist at the at the convention. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we it's had him on the main stage. Yeah, it's hard we, to argue. We were the new kids on the block. We, you know, this this convention, I mean, it's a bunch of podcasters. I feel like 99% of those podcasters there had done stuff like that before or, or have done Rock and Pod five years in a row or something crazy like that. And we were brand new and we got, in my opinion, the coolest guy. So, yeah. Yeah, when we when it was confirmed that we had him, not only did we have him, but we were going to get him on the main stage for an extended interview, a 45 minute interview in front of a larger audience that was gathered around. Uh, to me, that was a home run. So, yeah. And, uh, you know, and as you said, probably the biggest selling star. I don't think there's any doubt. I mean, just the sales of Stay Hungry alone. And uh, we talked to him a little bit about that. He was very forthcoming. I got to give him credit. Yeah, uh, I, I, I kind of shit myself in a couple of the questions <laughs> that you asked him. You asked him, like, well, how many copies did that sell? I'm like, Dave, what are you, you know, that's, I don't know. Yeah. Like, hey, how many cars do you have? You know, like, Dave, <laughs> stop, you know. Stop. Well, I told him, I, st I told him straight up. I was like, look, man, I'm, I'm not looking for a dollar figure, but I want our audience to right. have a sense of, what those kinds of sales can afford a guy like you, not just the band, you as an individual, uh, does the sales of stay hungry, pay your mortgage? Can you retire? Is it just extra vacation money? That sort of thing. And he was very, you know, no, just you're, very you, forthright. You were, you're in the, you're in the right. It's just, uh, I just am a chicken shit maybe to <laughs> dig into someone's wallet and go, damn, there's a lot of fucking money in here. You know, that, that was, that's kind of what it felt like. Well, like I was going through their fancy laundry or something, you know? Yeah. I, I, I kind of got a vibe off of him that, that he was going to be cool with that sort of thing. And yeah. I'm, you know, I, I try to always keep the audience in mind and I'm like, man, people are going to want to know this. And if he'll share that, then let's hear it. Sure. But and, in uh, my mind, I'm going, someone's breaking into his fucking car right now <laughs> because you asked him that, you know? Well, oh, damn, that guy's a rich rock star. I bet he's got some hundies in the glove box. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, he know. was he was great. Uh, he didn't was have awesome. any problem with any of the questions. No. The stories were incredible. Uh, well, you know, he, he, we learned. I learned one thing. He really likes comfortable shoes. <laughs> To a fault. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we talked about comfortable shoes. And, yeah. and uh, out there in podcast land, talk, talk louder listeners and watchers here. Do you like comfortable shoes? Then you have something in common with Eddie Ojeda from Twisted Sister. <laughs> um, everybody likes comfortable shoes. It's kind of a health. You need to, you need to keep your feet healthy. Yeah, yeah. So well, well. Even while you're on a photo shoot, uh, that would let that be the hint there. Yeah, we'll, we'll leave it at that. What, uh, what, what album cover were they shooting? Do you oh, know? just a little album called Stay Hungry. Was it, was it Stay Hungry? Okay. Yes. So, so everyone, while you listen to this, stare at the inner uh, photograph, the band shots. Uh, uh, it's the back cover. The band. 
fo- the back cover. Okay, focus yeah. on Eddie's shoes while you're listening to this interview that <laughs> we're about to to give you here. Yeah, uh, he was yeah. awesome. He was fun. He, you're right. We got him to laugh a little bit. I liked it that he had his son with him. Yeah, uh, his son was helping him with his booth, and. Dag nabbit, I did not get one of those old school can't stop rock and roll t-shirts. We need to find a way to reach out. God damn, those were awesome. I bet he's got a way. I had one of those back in the day and then it just turned into a dish rag. Yeah, I had one I mean, too. I didn't I had, use it as a dish rag. It just shrank. I, yeah, I had one too. It was the jersey. Mine was gray with oh, black sleeves shit, and had the yeah. TS logo on it. Yeah, uh, these are, and Eddie these was kind are, enough... He was kind enough to autograph my uh, You Can't Stop Rock and Roll vinyl, which is, as I promised him, it's already framed and hanging on the wall. Of course. Well, you uh, you got that out of the way right away. Yeah. Yeah. That was not, there was no cameras. You were like, Eddie, please, right now, so I can put this away. Right. Yeah. Well, I ran into him in the green room. And, uh, you know, we were being uh, performers or participants, whatever you want to call it. We had access to the green room. We could come and go as we please. And I saw him walk into the green room and I just followed him in there and started chatting him up. And uh, and I told him we were about to interview him and just kind of breaking the ice. And he was really, really cool. And uh, and, and that cool just, you know, he brought that with him on stage and, you know, just a really gracious, humble guy with lots of stories and uh, and he didn't mind my digging when I started asking questions. Right. Well, he seemed very calm. He did not break stride once. No. And you know, uh, and, and we as, still got him to laugh a little bit. So. Yeah, we did get him to laugh a little bit and uh, as someone who grew up in the 80s, uh, you know, Twisted Sister was practically I mean, they practically lived in my house. They were on MTV 55 times an hour, you know, for, for years. And there's, their videos are, are some of the most iconic in MTV history. So uh, it, it was not only talking to a musician, it was talking to a guy who was part of my life uh, in, in, a, in my formative years. You couldn't avoid Twisted Sister if you were 15 or 16 years old in 1984, 85, 86. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and, it, and it to, was to, fun. To, not to pat our, pat our own backs here, but this is the second member of Twisted Sister we have had on the Talk Louder podcast. That is correct. We've had JJ pretty, French. Feeling pretty and good that, about that. Yeah. And if you missed the JJ French episode, I encourage you to go back and, and check it out because, man, I was in stitches the entire time. That guy was great. <laughs> I clicked on that the other day and watched watched a bit of that, and and it was it, he was great, and he yeah. would he was uh, very honest to say the least. Brutally, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and just you know, I think we opened our mouths and said hello, and then he just ran with it. And I've always yeah. said. I don't care if I get another word in, as long as what the guest is saying is pure gold, let him talk. And JJ was that guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel like, I feel like, uh, Eddie was a little bit, uh, Eddie was great. Eddie, Eddie answered questions. We, we didn't really get off track that much, probably cause you were sitting next to him and I was on the outskirts just playing with my microphone. <laughs> I don't well, think he, I, I don't think I definitely did, I don't think I did much good except uh clap my hands and and lean in and go and then remember that time yeah no oh, you you were great I, everything the chemistry was fine it worked great and uh yeah Eddie's a little more reserved than than JJ oh, yeah. but uh he, he was he was more than happy to talk to us and I really appreciated his honesty and his candor and, and the fact that he played along even when I was digging into his financials. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was so awesome. Thank you for that, Eddie Ojeda. Yeah. yeah, that was great fun. Yeah. Eddie Ojeda on the Talk Louder podcast. Welcome to Rocket Pod 2023. We got any fans of Twisted Sister in the house today? Oh, yeah. Right here. Yo. Yeah, two of them. One of the greatest bands of all time. We got a rock and roll heavy metal hall of famer with us here today. I know so many people came down here to see Eddie. And if we're going to kick things off on the main stage, I can't think of a better way to do it. So, your very first live interview right here, right now, my boys. 
from the Talk Louder podcast, Jason McMaster, Metal Dave Glesner right here. And Thank they're, y'all. They're Thank you for be, being here you. early. They're going to be bringing up the man. So, gentlemen, I'm going to turn things over to you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Thanks, man. How's everybody doing out there? Everybody awake? Another cup of coffee? Well, that reminds me. I <laughs> should go get some coffee. <laughs> I've reached my coffee quota. I'll yep. be up twice during this interview to use the restroom if I have any more. If uh, if Eddie doesn't, is, if Eddie's not here in like two minutes, I might. I'll go, I'll, I'll wing it. I'll wing it if you have to use I the might restroom. Grab a coffee. Yeah, yeah. That, that is that's fine. Me and Eddie will get to know each other a little bit. <laughs> well, When's the first time you saw Twisted Sister? Ooh, I love this. You're you're we're interviewing each other now. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I saw Twisted Sister for the first time in 19, I'm going to say 84, but it could have been 83. It was on Can't Stop Rock and Roll Tour. Ah. It was at Cardi's in Austin, Texas. There was this club. There was one in Houston and one in Austin called Cardi's. Yeah. I tell this story all the time. Um. I wasn't old. They changed the drinking age. I wasn't old enough to get in. And so my mom took me, my brother, and my friend Brian Bowen. Oh, yeah. And she's like, these are my sons. They're too young. So, And they, they let us in. And my mom sat in the back and read a book. <laughs> During a Twisted Sister gig. Yeah. And I took, uh, <laughs> I took her camera, and I was in the front row. There's only like 10 or 15 people in the club. In the opening band was an all-male strip review. Oh. So the whole club was full of women screaming at an all-male strip, re- you know, like Chippendales. Don't ask yeah. me how I know what anything about Chippendales. <laughs> <laughs> Used to be one, dude. I you? quit years ago. Yeah, that's what I yeah. thought. Yeah, that is on your resume. You get resume. married, you get this tire. You know, it's you on get, your resume. You can't do it. Well, right? we had J.J. French on the Talk Louder podcast, and he told us that story, and it was hilarious. That yeah. They, the, and how then he, the crowd left. Yeah, he was peeking, at, <laughs> peeking in the back door of the club, and he's like, oh, my God, all right, the club is, like, full of women, and they're going fucking crazy for <laughs> yeah. the opener, and... And even though it's like disco or whatever, because yeah, it was like he was stoked. Yeah, somebody was pre-recorded tape, and they were just yeah. like doing their oonts, oonts, you know. Yeah, yeah, he was pretty fired up. The moves thought- that I, I don't know the moves anymore, but anyway. <laughs> so the club is all these women, you know, cougars, I guess. Leave the club. Twisted Sister comes on and plays for like fifteen dudes. <laughs> and it was it was one of the greatest moments in my life. It was so fucking cool. Oh, I got yeah. intro music. Here he comes. There he is. I love it. All right. There he is. Eddie Ojeda, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, Eddie Ojeda. We love this guy. Yeah. Sit over here, Eddie. We want you over here. If you don't mind. Thanks, Sorry. man. How are you, man? Doing great. Man, I was doing about great. to start singing that shit and turn it down. <laughs> Saved by the bell every time. Yeah, it is kind of hot. Thanks for joining us today, man. My pleasure. Pleasure to be here with you. Likewise. Uh, have you done one of these before? Rock and Pod events? No, this is the first Rock and Pod I did. Okay, that yeah. makes three of us then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, well, thanks for being here. Uh, we got a lot of questions for you. We're going to try to make it more conversational instead of an interrogation. Okay. We, we're not the cops. We don't want you to be uncomfortable. <laughs> All right. No problem. Uh, why don't you start by telling us just how you got hooked on rock and roll? What's the uh, the album, oh, the boy. moment, the concert? What was it that, that made you say, I want to do that? You know, a lot of people say the Beatles, obviously. I mean, from Lemmy to I don't know who, but... Uh, you know, I saw, I was a little kid, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and uh, I mean, it kind of blew everybody's minds. It was like 70 million people saw that show. Yeah. I mean, some people don't even know what, who Ed Sullivan is, <laughs> but uh, that was back when people used to, like the whole family would watch the same show. Sure, sit around On Sundays, TV. you know, it would be Ed Sullivan, then Bonanza. Yeah. So... so <laughs> And, uh, you know, you all watch. So when I saw them on there, I, I told my parents, I think that's what I want to do. And they laughed. 
you know, for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Were they laughing after the success of Stay Hungry? <laughs> no, that's when, uh, that, that's what it took. <laughs> Yeah, because even when I was, you know, playing gigs all the time, they kept saying, "When are you going to get a real job?" Yeah, yeah. And I said, "Well, this is a real job. I'm making a living." You know, I, was, I mean, we were playing clubs four or five nights a week. And back then, you had to do three sets, three four sets a night. Sure. And even if the place was empty, like people would leave late at night. It's like two o'clock in the morning to go up and do a set. But, you know, the club owners would still make you go up there and play. Yeah. For, like, the three drunk dudes that were sleeping at the bar. <laughs> so, so, what was, so what was, this is kind of a, this might be too personal. What was the payday back in those days for a, a, th a triple threat matinee kind of thing? Well, it, it, once, the club circuit got very big for us. We started playing, the, yeah. you know, very quickly. Uh, you know, we just blew up. And we were playing the whole tri-state area. So the money went up quite a bit. You know, I mean, we were playing clubs and making 10 grand a night. Back wow. then? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And that's, that's ten, you know. 10 grand a night for a, for a matinees, three in a row? No, no, no. Oh. No, no. The thing is, that was uh, for the whole night, you know. But, oh, right, right. But then okay. that's, at that point, we were just doing two sets a night. But, mm -hmm. you know, in the beginning, it started out like, you know, $500 yeah, uh, which is when you think about when that was. I don't want to say dates. I don't want to embarrass you. Know. That, was was a little, a, that was a little while ago. That was when five hundred dollars was like two thousand. Yeah. dollars. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, it was a while ago, and you know, it's it took a while, but we built it up very quickly where we were playing all these really big clubs, and the place would just be wall to wall, and. Um, a lot of times we would just play for the door because these big clubs would hold like two, three thousand people. Yeah. Or the Fountain Casino could hold like five thousand people. So even though they were clubs, they were huge. And, yeah. And you know, and there was a couple of bands in the, on that whole circuit that were at that level making that kind of money. But it was worth it for the club owners because you know, they made a ton of money at the sure, bar. Sure. Sure. You guys, um, your first album uh, was produced by Pete Way of UFO fame. Yeah, Pete. And uh, I wanted to know, what was it like working with Pete? Because he's got a uh, reputation. He was a wild man, wasn't he? I love Pete, and we miss him, you yes, know. Yes, we do. But uh, he was like a, a non-producer, really. I mean, <laughs> he, he yeah, was you there, had, but, you had a guy know. That, you had a drinking buddy produce your record. Yeah, he, you know... I remember in the morning, he, he, you know, we, if I went with him to the studio, he would say, hey, let's stop by the pub for a quick one, you know? I'm like, I said, Pete, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> he says, well, just a quick pint, you know? And I said, what are you going to drink? He says, oh, as much as possible. <laughs> So he, he was, I've heard people say that you have producers that are hands-on and very skilled, and then you have producers that are just sort of vibe dudes. Like they're, they kind of create a vibe in an environment, and their, mo their role is more, you know, just personal rather than skilled. Yeah, that's what it was with Pete. Yeah. Um, you know, we love the guy. He was a great guy. And, uh, you know, then he went on to do that whole thing with... Uh, Fastway, yeah, you know, with uh, Eddie Clark, right, from Motorhead, yeah, and at that time we also became really close with Lemmy, right, and um, one of the first shows we did, we opened for Motorhead, you know, and we were still wearing makeup, yeah, so we were like pretty scared, you know, rough uh, crowd, but you know, us wearing makeup was like football players wearing makeup. I don't know, so. <laughs> You know, because we were all kind of big guys. Right. And, um, you know, but, but Lemmy came out and introduced us. And, uh, man, that that really won everybody over. And that really helped us big time. Yeah, I've, I've read that and I've heard that story before. Uh, that, I mean, a Motorhead crowd is a pretty tough crowd. And then you Very. guys come on all dolled up. And, uh, you yeah, know, yeah, it could have been ugly. But, but Lemmy had your back. Yeah, and it went over great. I mean, we uh, worked with them quite a bit. You know, yeah. After that, so he kind of introduced us to England, and uh, you know we had there's a it was a real strong buzz in England about us. There was bootleg tapes of us our shows, and that's we got signed. For the first time we got signed was to a 
English label. Yeah. Called, yep. called Secret, Secret Records. Records yeah. it, it was a really a secret, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Well, the rough cuts <laughs> and the, the, the earliest pressings, uh, I had to buy import price. Exactly, Because I yep. was buying the secret versions of, uh, well, and it, the, Under the Blade as well as I have an import version of uh, uh, Can't Stop Rock and Roll as well. Different, the, different album cover the, colors, the, such. Yeah, those are hard to get, actually. They're yeah. collector's uh, items. So. You have any on sale over at your booth today? No, I yeah. don't. Uh, <laughs> well, mine's not for sale. It has, I, <clears throat> it's signed by the, it's got AJ on, it's got everybody. Oh, wow. I was just uh, telling uh, the story that I've told you a hundred times every time we meet. Uh, I, I hadn't told you today until right now. I was telling these guys, I saw Twisted Sister on that tour in uh, Austin, Texas at a club called Cardi's where there was an all-male review as the opener. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, see, he knows. He, yeah. How could he forget? Yeah. <laughs> Unforgettable night. You guys played for like me and like ten of my friends, and it was fucking. You guys played. Everybody here has seen Twisted Sister play, right? Doesn't matter if there's five people in the audience or five million people. It's the same show, full on power. It's like a tank uh, mowing you over, and that's what it was like. Yeah. Well, our attitude was, you know, let's kick ass anyway. You know, yeah. um, even if there's five people here. Yeah. Because it was like, you know, just a good way to just rehearse, practice your show. You know? Sure. So it's like a paid rehearsal. Like Correct. I said, club owners didn't care if the place right. was empty. They still wanted you to play. Well, here's yeah. another thing, too. Uh, and I know that you guys learned early on because you were, you were quite seasoned at the time already anyway. But I learned a lot as a young musician. Uh, and it was like, What? It's like after they played, they went backstage and, you know, I was telling them, my mom was there. They had just changed the fucking drinking age. So me and my friends were like, yeah, she's our mom. And it's like, what? You know, my friends <laughs> were saying, yeah, Jason's mom is our mom. And, you know, so we got in. My mom sat in the back and read a book. Bless her heart. <laughs> and and uh, after the show, it's like, wow, man, that was incredible. And I had my records with me. I had a stack of Twisted Sister records with me. And uh, I was like, well, maybe they're not going to come out, but I'm glad I brought these anyway, just in case. And as sh soon as I formed that sentence, you guys had gone back and wiped off the makeup and came out looking like you, gonna, you were going to just murder everybody in the room, <laughs> you know, leather jackets and shit. <laughs> and they, you guys hung out. D. Snyder gave me a joint. He did? He gave me a joint because he oh, said wow. someone gave it to him, and he goes, I don't smoke this shit. You no, want he, this? Yeah. He gave it to me. I put it in a, in a plastic bag, and I, I, I would like wrote on it, gave it an authenticity certificate given to me by D. Snyder on this date, blah, 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 blah. I had roommates. I come home from work one day, and the joint was gone. Oh, uh, too bad. But that's okay. That's all right. It was probably <laughs> oregano anyway. But the point is, <laughs> is you guys came out and signed all of our shit, and that was the, like... You know, only, I mean, I'd seen other bands. By that time, I had seen Metallica and Raven and underground bands coming. Right. And they came out and hung out with everybody. And when you guys did that, because you guys were just about to break. Yep, yep. With that yeah. MTV, you know, Can't Stop Rock and Roll and such. Exactly. Uh, and I just, as a fan, I just, this is how you do it. This, you, yeah. you, you make friends with your fans. This is real. It's family. It's yep. a rock and roll as a family. So. That's, that's what we did. Thank I mean, you. It was, you know, Thank you for that. You're welcome. And it was like, uh, people think it's overnight when all of a sudden everybody hears about the band when you break. Yeah. But it was like 10 years to get to that point. Yeah. You know, yeah. And like a, a couple of thousand shows. It's fairly well documented yeah. that you guys were. Yeah. Uh, I think JJ said it best. It was like we were a band from the 70s that made it in the 80s. Exactly. That's yeah. what happened. Yeah. yeah. Kind of an amazing, you know, if it happens too fast, uh, that can be bad. I think so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the good thing about having so many shows under your belt is that, you know, you're so comfortable on stage. You can say, you know, there's times where you're thinking about like, oh, I gotta wash my, my clothes, man. It's like, you know, you're that comfortable, you're in the middle of a solo and say, did I wash my clothes? <laughs> oh, I gotta think about it. And you, you know, Tell not me. that you're bored, but it, you know, you just- No, I get you know, it. Mind one. Playing you got a so checklist. Much, yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, you know, then it just becomes like second nature. 
you know? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the success of uh, Stay Hungry, obviously a blockbuster album. Um, and I don't want to get too personal, and I don't need a dollar amount, but, but J.J. <laughs> J.J. French has said that that music, uh, we're not going to take it, and I want to rock are, are the most licensed songs in rock and roll. Yep. So what does that mean to you as an individual? What does that afford you? Do, can you live off it? Does it pay for your car? Is it just extra, like, vacation money? All, Give of, me the, a all of the above. <laughs> ah, okay, wow. So how many, how many millions of copies did that sell? Um... I think it was up to, it's up to, in total, I think we got 20 million. 20 million. 20 million. So, yeah, I guess you could live yeah. off of that. Let's think about that for yeah, a second. Which is unheard of now. Yeah, you know, right. Because everything is digital and whatever. So, uh, the, so the videos, of course, were, became part of pop culture. And, yeah. and you guys, up to that point, were kind of known as this gritty bar band. And then all of a sudden, you're all over MTV, and the, and the videos are kind of slapstick comedy. So it seems like the, the videos would have been like a blessing and a curse. Were, were there some downsides to the videos? No, those the videos were very successful because, like you said, they were funny. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea was like a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like uh, the guy getting thrown through a basket, and you know that's that that sound that stuntman actually got hurt pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. that was real. I mean, he got shot into the. In, for, you know, I want to rock. He got shot into the basket with a, like the a catapult. Or producer kind of, have insurance? Right. Wow. Uh, the guy who did the guy who directed that was Marty Kalner. Oh yeah, and he did a lot of HBO things with Chris Rock and a lot of comedians. And yeah. he was a big time HBO guy. And uh, it's funny because after he did our video, he was getting calls from every band like Aerosmith, uh, The Heart. All these bands wanted him to do uh, their videos. Right. Your video became his calling card. That's you know, amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, Again, with uh, Stay Hungry, that, that album, uh, Mark Wise is here, the photographer who shot the cover of that album. Yeah, he's in the back over there. Yeah, and an iconic image, but in some ways it also kind of, did it cause a little friction in the band that D was featured on the cover and the rest of you guys were on the back? Yeah, sort of. We're like, hey, what happened? <laughs> but uh, there was a reason for that, and... Because when we were doing that photo shoot, I'm not going to say who it was, but two of the guys weren't taking it very seriously. So a lot of the band shots came out shitty. Yeah. So that's why D ended up on the cover with the bone. Right. You know, um, and then we were on the back. And there's a funny story about that because I didn't know they were going to shoot a full length thing. So I was wearing really comfortable shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but they did not look rock and roll. <laughs> Flip flops. So uh, Atlantic, you know, Jason Flom from Atlantic Records was so pissed off about my shoes. <laughs> I said, "Really? It's, it didn't hurt the album sales. Maybe it, you know, maybe those shoes had something to do with it." You know. <laughs> so if, in the back of the Stay Hungry album, if you look at the shoes, they're like these blue leather shoes that I regret wearing, but it's you know, <laughs> it's there forever. <laughs> Well, it's an iconic image in the album, of course, puts you guys over the top, and the, and the videos that went with it. Uh, you also became known, your bullseye guitar is iconic. So yeah. what did you think the first time you saw Zach Wilde with a bullseye guitar? Well, I wasn't too happy about it, you know? I was like, why would he do that? You know, because he got a boatload of shit for it. Yeah. And he still, you know, when we, I guess he thought, you know, we, we had split up, and then, you know, he also stole the jacket thing, too, with the colors. The oh, yeah. Because yeah. you know, he used to come see us all the time. He was, you know, and, uh, you know, he kind of, I heard his, his excuse was, well, mine's a Les Paul and it's black and white. I said, <laughs> eh, not really. It's, you know, but the whole bullseye guitar thing, I never thought it was going to become such a deal. I mean, I seen people with tattoos of it. Um, they've used that guitar for ads of, for some of our shows. Yeah, you know, not a picture of the band, but it's my guitar where it says "Twisted Sister." So, it's. Uh, How did you come up with that? 
basically the, our logo has is kind of like a bullseye. Mm -hmm. So I wanted something to match uh, the logo. So I told, that was Charvel guitars at the time. Yeah. I told them I want something, you know, pink and black circles. And then they just did a bullseye. And I said, oh, okay, that's cool, it matches. And our amplifiers had, we had pink circles on the speakers, on the Sound City speakers. So it kind of went with the stage thing. Yeah. But, you know, that was one of the, f when they first started making those graphic hot rod guitars. Yeah, yeah. And um, that was the first bullseye ever made. Um, and because it got so well known, anybody that did a bullseye got a boatload of shit and they had to change it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, not that I got, I didn't have to say anything. Right. You know? Have you and Zach talked about this at any point? Not really. Yeah. Uh, there was one time where we were both in the same hotel, and you know, we, we kind of walked by each other. And uh, I mean, I could talk to him about it, but I think once we got back together again, he, st he started changing a lot of the, his guitars. I don't know if you know, he's yeah, a, the buzz guitar. His and, graphics are yeah. yeah. He hardly uses the bullseye anymore. Right, right. And uh, But you know, he got, I mean, there's a, good story with Vivian Campbell um, we opened up for D we did a show we did a tour with Dio and Vivian Campbell was a guitar player at the time mm -hmm. so you know we're backstage and I see one of his guitars is duct tape with black duct tape mm -hmm. I said why is there that guitar all duct tape he goes I gotta tell you when I saw your guitar I thought it was so cool I had the same one made <laughs> <laughs> but he said he got so much shit for it that he and then when we were on tour he didn't want me uh -oh. <laughs> so he duct taped the guitar <laughs> so, well how did it look with the duct tape on it sounds kind of cool well, yeah. it, I thought yeah I thought it was kind of a cool thing but yeah. uh, I, you know he used the guitar it sounded fine you know but it was just duct tape well his trend yeah. with duct tape wasn't as big a trend as you with no, the bullseye no it didn't go over it didn't become right. a thing yeah the yeah. bullseye yeah very iconic uh, talk a little bit about the New York Steel. It was the concert that Eddie Trunk put together following 9-11 uh, to benefit firefighters, first responders. Right. And it was also the catalyst, if I'm not mistaken, to, sort of, to reuniting Twisted Sister. Yep. And yep. since that time, you've been reactivated and, and done shows since then. Tell us about how that conversation went among the band members. Okay, well, originally... You know, it was terrible when the, the whole World Trade Center thing happened. And they did a thing at Madison Square Garden, but they had like people like Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and you know, um, those type of bands, you know, who else? It was mostly like a lot of the soul acts and stuff like that. And we we had offered, we said, well, you know, we'd like to play too, you know, save, raise money. And they said we were too inflammatory. Yeah. I said, you mean like a hemorrhoid? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that sounds like they're trying to give you this backhanded compliment. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, you, guys like, are stu you guys are too hardcore. Like, you're, you're too inflammatory for yeah, this show. I'm like, okay, so that's when Eddie Trunk said, why don't we just do our own thing? You yeah. know, and then Ace came on board, you know, on Anthrax. And that was another thing, Anthrax, people wanted them to change their name. Yeah. And they wore suits and said, we're not changing our name at that show. Yeah. That was like a classic, you know, I forget the name of the the, the, the theater. It's a, I held like four, four or 5,000 people. Yeah. So, you know, we raised a lot of money for the firemen and the police department. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, yeah, I think we raised like 150,000, something like that. That was amazing. And, yeah. uh, yeah, it was great that um, everybody jumped in on that. So how yeah. did the phone calls go bounce around band members? Because presumably at that point you guys hadn't, I'm not saying you weren't speaking, but you weren't an active band, so you no. were kind of reaching out, and this was the occasion to do so. Exactly. Uh, how were those conversations, and how did they get started? Well, we all felt like, hey, we got to do something. This is really yeah. horrible. And, you know, we know we knew people that were... They lost their lives there. I mean, it really affected everybody personally. Yeah. So we said we have to do something, and then Eddie Trunk came up with the whole idea. Also, Mike Piazza from the Mets. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's how it came about. It was just we got to do this, and that's that was it. Everybody was on board with it, and uh, yeah. And we didn't know if it was gonna 
make the group reunite again. But after that, we got so many offers to start playing again where we kept turning it down. But then it got to the point where this is stupid if we turn this down. I mean, you know, because, <laughs> you know, you get offers, you go, ah, okay, well, maybe no. But then, you know, when they hit the right spot, you know. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's like, well, if we don't do this, we're being stupid. Yeah. You know. And, so the uh, lesson here is never break up the band, really. Never really break up the band. Right. You can you can just go home for a while. Oh, we're yeah. just at home. I'm got my feet kicked up, you know. But well, when the zeros add up, you're like, oh, yeah. we we're stupid if we don't. You know, yeah. Because it was uh, it was just one of those things that why not, you know? But it uh, and none of us ever went out, you know, like some bands have all new guys and there's like three versions of the same sure. band right none of us ever did that so the name right. and the original original members sure. meant something so sure. it was a big deal for the original band to get back together and uh i mean we were more popular then than than ever yeah that's yeah. right we were yeah. headlining festivals all well, over and, europe and aj yeah. you had aj yeah and uh thank god that twisted sister kind of reformed there uh, for something to do something good for your community exactly. for America yeah. yeah and then and then all of these great things start happening and then um, uh, tragedy with AJ yeah, yeah. The, your brother 2015 you know, your family yeah it was you know and he was the youngest guy in the van oh, wow so, terrible and AJ was such a great guy on top of being an amazing drummer I don't yes. think underrated drummer uh, you know I think because Twisted being the band it is like a lot of times people don't realize some of the musicianship that's involved AJ could play with anybody he was one of those drummers that yeah I mean he was you know him and Mike Portnoy he's like that kind of drummer you know yeah. and uh, he has tremendous memory you know he could do a whole track with no vocal no no rhythm guitar no click track probably well he could play with a click with sure, no problem sure which a lot know, of drummers cannot play with a click no and that's so, not good yeah. you know you need to no, be able to play with a click no it's not good yeah AJ could groove to a click and uh, but what used to amaze me is you know we, we learned a song and then we go record it and usually I'd put a scratch guitar on for him and yeah. maybe a scratch vocal but he would say no I don't need it I said how are you going to know when the changes are <laughs> you know and he goes I know, I got it. And I swear, he could play the whole thing, keep perfect time wow. for that click. You hear, anytime you turn the click on, it was like right there. He was, you know, and I never seen a drummer that could play an entire song without any kind of reference. Well, here's the, yeah. here's the thing. When it's you, crazy. When you write a song and then record a song, this is most of the time prior to you ever playing the song live. Sometimes, not maybe not all the time. Maybe you have something in the set list that's new, and you're trying it on, and that's always like uh, an advantage before you go in the studio because you know what tempo feels the best. We should record this faster because we're feeling it faster on stage. So yeah. let's make it cohesive, right? But for Eddie recording a song without, <clears throat> you know, AJ. without basically without. I'm sorry. AJ, AJ recording yeah. a tune without you scratch even your scratch tracks and knowing where the dynamic is when to open the hi-hats when when the you know the chorus is big and the chorus is and right and the, ride the solo and yeah, the right. verses are and where the solo is and what to how big to play how open and uh to play and when to kind of you know shh in the verses and without you without the band yeah. Is unbelievable. <laughs> it is. Yeah, he was an uh, underrated drummer. I, I always thought that, you know, when I heard the uh, You Can't Stop Rock and Roll record, that's the first album from Twisted Sister that I heard. And you could just tell he was a powerhouse drummer. Yeah, he reminded me of, he was like a Cozy Powell kind of drummer. Yeah, there you go. You yeah. know, that, just a powerhouse, man. Yeah. And he was always on, man. Just so on. I mean, the only thing that would happen... When we played live, a lot of times we'd do songs so much faster that, like, a melodic lead would turn into, like, a speed solo, right. you know? <laughs> it, it was, sometimes it was almost comical we were going so, playing so fast. Yeah. But it was kind of, uh, you know, D used to kind of, 
he used to start doing the this and that and all like this and that. Speed so, it up, slow it down. Yeah. Speed yeah. up, slow it down, and uh, you know, just the energy. In fact, I used to hate doing sound checks because we do a sound check and everybody's playing a certain way. And I said, why don't you play the way you're going to play when, when people are here? Because that's a whole different band when oh, yeah. this room is full. <laughs> yeah. I said, the, all of a sudden, what happened to the sound check? I, I was, I heard Adrenaline everything. is a motherfucker. <laughs> I could hear everything before. Now everybody turned up to Warp 5 or some shit. <laughs> tell, tell us about uh, how surprised were you at the success of the Christmas album? Because on, on paper, I got to tell you, I was like, what are they thinking? But that album, <laughs> seriously, Twisted Sister fans, were, was anybody waiting for a Twisted Sister Christmas album? He was. He okay. Loved it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, but with all due respect, I mean, it's not something you would picture on paper. And you guys did it, and it was a huge success. It was. I mean, and funny about that, like, other people did Christmas songs after that. A lot of heavy metal guys. Right. Alice did one. Um, I forgot who else. There was a lot of people all of a sudden, hey, Let's do Christmas songs. That's so, yeah. all. It, it was something we did. You know, we got a good offer from Razor and Tie. Mm -hmm. they, they do those compilation albums, like the hits from the eighties, yeah. the seventies, and was, so that's their big thing. Good so, at that. oh, you like that voice? Yeah, you could uh, yeah. make a second career out of that. Yeah, I've been trying, but I, I don't know. <laughs> I got to walk around like that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so they gave us. A, they said, "Yeah, well, you know, sounds like a good idea." And. I never thought it was going to be so successful. Yeah. You know, because um, nobody had ever, no hard rock band had ever done something like that. Right, right. And, you know, it was, it was fun to, to make, but like, I, you know, who knew? Yeah, I, again, I was like, I was kind of shocked that you guys were going to do that and even more shocked that it was so successful. But I mean, congratulations, that's great. Thank and you. it did start a trend. A lot of other people kind of followed along. Yep. I wanted to ask you, I, I didn't know this, uh, but I think I read somewhere that when Stay Hungry started blowing up, uh, one of the opening acts on that tour for you guys was Metallica. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Tell us they about that. for us. That was wild because I had not, that was the first time I was exposed to like that thrash metal. Yeah. And in the beginning, you know, before like the newer albums, they were like full on thrash, super fast. We were like, what's going on with these guys, yeah. you know? <laughs> and, uh, but not to, I hate to interrupt, funny. but you were familiar with Motorhead and their fast songs, even though they're kind of playing one, four, five blues numbers right. on 10. Yeah. It's still not Metallica. No, Metallica was a whole different thing. Yeah. Um, and who knew? They ended up being bigger than, than everybody. Uh, yeah. You know? Um, you know, some people said they sold out when they got more a little more commercial, but I don't no, feel they I don't grew, think they, they ever grew did. up. They got they got they're not more, dumb mature. kids anymore. Yeah, yeah they're right. more that's mature. Right. It's it's kind of sad when people love a band when they're starting out and going and, through that rough time, and then when they make it, they get pissed off at them. <laughs> you know, like, right. oh, you're not the same band, man. Like, right. So I, I felt bad for them getting that rap. So ha having said what you just said, um, they're on tour with you, and this is 1984, so I, I guess they're doing the Ride the Lightning record. I'm, yeah, I'm assuming that's so yeah, are you the watching stuff. them? Are you watching them rise during the tour? What's your impression of no, them? No, I didn't really, I didn't really get it until we got back to America, because that was in, in, you know, it was in Europe. We only did a few shows with them. Okay. But, um, you know, I didn't realize that that was a whole trend of music that was, was going to happen. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, kind of spawned from the new wave of British heavy metal stuff. Yeah. Which, it was, Motor, uh, which Motorhead was most, part yeah, of. Yeah, Motorhead yeah. kind of started that. Yeah, that's right. And then Metallica took it to more of a prog level, you know, uh, instead of just straight 145 kind of stuff. Right. Yeah, it was right. like it was like eight riffs in a five minute song. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <It's in space. laughs> you got a good Lemmy impression there, too. Yeah, thank you. Um, what, uh, tell us about your hot sauce. Yes. T uh, what's it called? Where can people get it? And how did you get into the, much like the Christmas album, how the heck did you get into the hot sauce business? Well, a friend of mine who's a chef, his name is John Rosati. He had a, he has a bunch of, uh, sauces out, like wing sauces and a hot sauce. And, you know, he's just telling me, you know, I wouldn't mind doing a hot sauce. That's like, I'd like to do something like that. And at the time, I was, I used to have gout. 
I used to get gout in my foot, and um, I used to eat a lot of cherries. So I said, well, you know, how about doing a cherry hot sauce? Is there one out? He said, no. So that was the first cherry hot sauce ever made. Oh, wow. And once again, I kind of did it just to have a, a cool thing and not really thinking that it was going to be super big or make a lot of money or anything. And uh, I ended up getting a Scoville Award for that, which a Scoville Award is like an Oscar for hot sauce. Yeah. So then I did that, and then I decided to do another flavor, which I did the peach. But it was just something that, you know, I always liked hot sauce. And uh, a few people were had, like Mark Anthony had one out. And... Um, I forgot who else, but you know, I think Joe Perry did something once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, I don't think he still does it. I think he. But with me, I was fully involved in it, you know, and I paid for it, and it was nobody. I, nobody just gave it to me, so it was. It, you know, it's been fun. It's been like seven years now. It's yeah. and, uh It does good. It does can, okay. Can people just buy it at the grocery store? Or do they have to. No, order it it, basically, it's online now, online. mostly. Where, yeah. where, do, where do you get it? Where TwistedHotSauce.com. TwistedHotSauce.com. Wow. Of course. Yeah, it makes what perfect else? sense, right? Yeah. That's that's branding for you. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about uh, after Twisted Sister disbanded. I think I've got the timeline right, but at some point you had a band called Scarecrow. Yeah. Wow. You, that's good. You know. Hey, I I, I did my homework. Um, you, you are you're good. <laughs> you are my, know why you're my friend. Now you want now you know why I hang out. You with are those guys. good. <laughs> Tell us about Scarecrow, because I, I didn't know anything about the band. What did you sound like? How long what, did that band exist? And I think I read somewhere that there was as many as five studio albums. And I don't know if you were part of all of those or not. But anyway, tell me about your involvement in Scarecrow. When and, and how long was that? Yeah, I just, I, would, I was involved in the first one. And we, were, we lasted about a year. And I kind of said, well, this isn't happening fast enough for me. And I, I kind of bailed out. And then the lead singer got different guys, but he was using my my tracks uh -oh. for, for the album. One of those. Yeah, so like, you know, the, al the album comes out and he says additional musicians. And I'm like, I played all the guitar parts. What are you talking about? And so the, the guys that were in the pick with the second album, because we had a lot of stuff in the can. It was a really good band. I mean, uh, but... It just was didn't. it hard rock metal. It, it was like hard rock, like yeah. kind of Aerosmith, okay, kind of vibe. All right. And um, where can people find that? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. Research. I mean, yeah. But only the first album is the one I did play on. The other ones, I don't know who he. He got different guys to play on stuff later, and I think he tried to do it on his own, but it didn't happen. So. You, how, how long after that was? Sorry, Dave. No, how ahead. long after that was your solo record? Oh, like uh, at least ten years later. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah, eight to ten years. But I saw that. Oh, you're, you've got that for sale at your booth over yep, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And you gave me a copy a few yeah, years ago. Thank you for that. It's sure. really, really strong. Uh, you should hear this guy play guitar. It's yeah, a, say that. Ryan James Dio's on the album too. Yes, yeah. yes. And these things a song, and yeah. also Jolyn Turner. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he wow. got all the greats on there. Good line. Yeah. yeah. So uh, just to get Ronnie, in fact, we were playing in Puerto Rico together. Dio, Dio was opening for us. Wow. <laughs> what a change, right? Yeah. And because uh, when we opened for them, he had this big mountain, this gigantic stage. Yeah. And we had like three feet to play in, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, so now the things turned around. And so I asked him at that show, I said, listen, I wrote a song that's D.O.-ish. Uh, would, you, would you mind singing for me, doing singing on it? He goes, sure, just send it to me. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I was said, well, don't you, want, don't you want to hear it first before you commit? And... Uh, because I said, what if, what, if you, what if you hate the song, you know? Right. But uh, I was pretty sure he was going to like it because it was definitely his, the vibe was his kind of groove. Right. And uh, it was great to have him. I mean, I didn't know we were going to lose him. But the fact that uh, to get somebody like him to, to sing one of your songs, sure. is, it's an amazing thing to this day. 
Absolutely. I'm so grateful for him. Absolutely. I mean, with all you've accomplished, uh, the success of Twisted Sister and, uh, you know, you've done your hot sauce, you've done a Christmas album, <laughs> you've uh, had the solo record. Uh, what's left on your bucket list? What has Eddie Ojeda not yet accomplished musically? I'm doing a movie with The Rock. <laughs> ah, <laughs> doing a movie with The Rock. Yeah. Do you have a script in mind? No. My no. son... Does. Oh, okay. I was well, going to ask if that was your son. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah is. Cool. Yeah. What kind of movie? T tell us your idea for this movie. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's some sort of adventure, I guess. With uh, I think it would turn into an adventure. It's kind of like <laughs> a. It's, it's, it's about a guy that um, is deformed, and he gets a lot of static. People pick on him a lot. And yeah. It's kind of like movie. a sad thing that turns into like a, a good thing. Wow. Because it's, it's a guy that doesn't look good, and people make fun of his looks, and, uh, but he's an amazing person. Yeah. And he ends up, you know, he's still working on it, but he ends up at the end, you know, being this awesome guy that everybody loves, and people stop making fun of him. Wow. And uh, I'm not sure where he's going to go with it, but it's, it's kind of a sad story. You know, in the beginning. Yeah. The way he's treated, you know. Kind of like the elephant man kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Hunchback at Notre Dame, something like right. that. Right, that kind well, of Well, if you want me to call Chris Rock for you, um, or The Rock, I'll, the Rock, I'll, yeah. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll Chris Rock. I'll yeah. give him a call. Well, yeah. yeah. We'll I call him Dwayne because we're like that close. <laughs> <you know? Yeah. laughs> no, um, tell everyone here, what can we expect, if anything, uh, in regards to new Twisted Sister music or a full-blown tour? Well, I doubt that that's going to happen. I never say never, because you never know. But uh, <laughs> as far as Twisted doing something, again, I don't see it happening. Uh, but, you know, some of us are doing some stuff on the side. I'm, I'm doing a lot of session stuff with people. Yeah. That's mostly what I do, because I have a home studio, and I can just lay a track down and send it out. You know, I, I use Pro Tools very basically. You know, right. I don't, uh, I know it well enough to do tracks for people. Do you yeah. uh, have your name out there as hire me to play a solo on your record kind of a thing? No, it's just kind of friends. word of mouth. People that, yeah, friends. Friends and stuff? Friends, yeah. Mm -hmm. And people, um, I'm working on something right now that uh, I'm just going to do the solo on. I also did the Leslie West tribute album. Oh, cool. Yeah. And we did theme from Imaginary Western. Yeah. And Dee sang the vocal, and I, and I've, I played the guitar. I and, think I've uh, heard that. Yeah, it's online. It's uh, one of those video, yeah. those uh, lyric videos. Yeah. It's just, just put in Leslie West tribute. And it came out real good. I mean, I did the Leslie West, I did the solo note for note. Because wow. that's a solo you can't mess with. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, you know. Keep it true. I've seen people play it exactly, you know, and you can't just jam out to that. It has to be, you know, so respect to Leslie. Sure. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just a great solo. It's, you know, uh, it's one of his best solos or one of his more well-known solos. And yeah. Jack Bruce wrote the song, you know. So, wow, uh, yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, you know, very cool. Very cool. Who would you like to collaborate musically, collaborate with musically that you haven't had a chance to do yet? Um, I haven't really thought much about that. Jason's it, right here. Yeah, I would love to collaborate with. <laughs> yeah, because I'm, uh, you know, I kind of have songs that I want to do, and I thought about doing a solo, another solo record, but um, I don't know. I don't really haven't thought about who I want to collaborate with. So it's something that well, you I could may do. You could probably start with you. <laughs> I would love it. I would love it. But I was going to say, uh, push me uh, over the cliff. If there's, I love the question because, I mean, let's just put it on the table. You, you could have your own band right now if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whether uh, the measure of expectations, that's up to you as to what you want to do. I mean, right. touring is not. Probably, eh, it's kind of not attractive maybe right. sometimes, yeah, and, yeah. and that's normal. Mm -hmm. uh, but you you could probably pick almost whoever you wanted to make 
uh, like a band where it's same singer on all ten songs. Right, and, right. Uh, I, <clears throat> you could do that anytime you wanted to. Wouldn't everybody would like to hear an Eddie record just as a band? There you Thank go. You. I think it'd be fucking cool. I did do a few shows when I did the album. When I first put out the solo album. Yeah. I did some local shows with, um, you know, three other. It was like a three-piece band and with a lead singer. And, you know, we did pretty good, but, you know, I just, to take it on the road, I just didn't feel it was, uh, I mean, people loved the band. The, the yeah. few shows we did, it was uh, really good players, the guys, you know. Yeah, yeah. the measuring of expectations is what I was trying to just make gray yeah. area. So it, yeah. it was risky to try and go out on tour, you know. Yeah. And, oh, especially yeah. if you don't have, like, a, it's one thing if you have a hit record, something that's getting a lot of airplay, then you can go out and support it. But sometimes, I, do, don't you feel that sometimes it's it's not even about that? It's about writing a, a batch of really good songs. This is where I am as a as a musician in my life right now. I want to record this. Right, right. So it's just there for the people who are interested. But it's really more about your intellectual and your heart. And you want to make a record for the right reasons. And yeah. it's not about how big the check is going to be. Right, and, exactly. Yeah. Even when I did the solo album, I didn't expect to sell you know a million records or anything like that no. something i just did because i wanted to do a solo album i love that yeah, yeah. and yeah. i think that that is the right reason to make music anyway yeah so. you gotta do it for yourself just to do it yeah we've got a couple more minutes left i wanted to ask you one last question i hate to keep going back to stay hungry but it's such an iconic album yeah, uh, yeah. everyone here owns that album i'm sure was there a moment on that tour when you walked out on stage and went, oh, my God, we've turned the corner. It's, it's gotten out of control. We've hit the big time. Um, probably, yeah. Uh, we were on tour with Iron Maiden at the time okay. when that album came out. And that was amazing because every time we played, it was sold out yeah. you know, between us and Maiden. And people still talk about that show. And Maiden, you know, they didn't limit us with anything. And they loved it. We riled up the audience. Yeah. And it was one of those things that people came to see us, too, because usually when there's an opening band, you pe people start strolling in for the first band because they're waiting for the, the headliner. Right. But at 8 o'clock, the place was packed. Yeah. Everybody was there because they wanted, you know, the whole MTV thing was had blown up. And Maiden... Some bands would limit you and try to, like, uh, not give you full lights or the sound or whatever. A lot of bands yeah, they won't do that. Let you use the subwoofers, whatever. Right. I mean, that, that happens with Van Halen a lot, you know, on the Journey Tour. Yeah. That. But um, they were real cool about it. And some people, though, they would get pissed off that you got the audience so hyped up. Yeah. They, they loved it. They said, man, we come out, and they're like, we're on fire. They're ready to, you know, they, they asked us to, to do a bunch of tours with them, but, but somehow it never happened again. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a memorable tour that, for sure. That, I didn't see that tour, but in just kind of in my mind, if you think about Twisted Sister opening for Iron Maiden at, at, in a peaking moment as right. well. Right, right, yeah. Uh, it's kind of like you guys are, and you're saying, you, you know, Twisted getting the crowd pumped up and of course the headliner loves that why would you limit that band and oh let's not let them use the lights or the subwoofers even though they're pumping up well the, give it all to you so you can pump the crowd up even more and right. make the night that even was... more memorable it's smart uh it's smart execution it's the way to do a show yeah. and uh i was gonna say it's kind of like uh twisted opening for iron maiden is like uh you know, uh, <laughs> a hardcore biker band. Like, it's like Motorhead opening for Yes. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's like that. Uh, and I think that that's great. Uh, I'd buy sorry, that ticket. That. I'd, yeah, me I'd, too. I'd buy that ticket. Yeah, that yeah. was, that was yeah. a great time. I mean, uh, that was one of my favorite tours because, like I said, every night, 20,000 people, you know, yeah. sold out shows. And at the time, Maiden, Maiden was never a band that sold a lot of records. But they could sell out arenas. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they were one of those bands. So, uh, in fact, we were probably getting more airplay than they were sure. at the time. Oh, yeah. So it, it worked out really great. Yeah. It worked out really great with them. Eddie, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. 16-year-old uh, me can't believe I'm sitting here next to you. Uh, 
talking to Eddie Ojeda from Twisted Sister, ladies and love gentlemen. It. How about that? Let's Thank give you. a big hand. People love you, Eddie. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you so Thank much you for joining us yeah. today. Eddie Ojeda, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, yo, give it up for Eddie. Come on. Yeah.